So uh, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Thank you for staying to the end. We've had many big ideas. And I'm going to wrap it all up with one you've been waiting for, which is, of course, the money idea. Um, so uh, my story uh, behind this idea has a beginning, a middle, and a, an uncertain end, although my, my talk has a certain end after five minutes. And it begins, my story, 20 years ago in Texas, south of Dallas, 1993, the cancellation of the superconducting super collider by Congress. Overnight, the academic job market for physicists collapses. This is what's left of it. And a cohort of physics and mathematics PhD, D PhDs decamps to Wall Street. And this generation, the superconducting super collider generation, catalyzes a remarkable growth in the sophistication, complexity, technological advances of financial engineering, the quantitative analysts, the quants, enable banks, hedge funds, investment firms to analyze and price complicated financial instruments, derivatives, financial instruments whose value derives from, depends on other financial quantities like the price of an apartment in South Beach, Florida or, or the price of the Japanese yen. And this growth of financial engineering is explosive, exponential for 15 years until wham, the middle of my story. 15th of September, 2008, the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers. These are the Lehman Brothers traders awaiting their fate. You can imagine the bubble competition. You are allowed any shirt color as long as it's white or light blue. I, I, di I did not get that memo. So what went wrong? What was the quant delusion? What went wrong? Well, first of all, the assumptions behind those models were proven to be incorrect. Assumptions about the correlation between house prices in South Beach and in Las Vegas were badly misspecified. But that's not really a surprise. A lot of applied modeling has assumptions that can be wrong. Weather forecasts can be wrong. Okay, but more foundationally and more fundamentally, and this is the, the genesis of the big idea, is that the foundational underpinnings of quantitative finance, of the edifice of quantitative finance built by these quants, was shown to be incorrect. Sound logical arguments that have been taken for granted were shown not to hold. Basic orderings of prices were shown not to hold. A contract that paid you $2 in 10 years' time suddenly became worth less than one that paid you $1 in 10 years' time. So there's an analogy with mathematics here which I think is illuminating. The axiom of choice is an axiom that underpins pure mathematics and set theory. It allows mathematicians to do neat stuff, like order subsets of any subset of the real numbers. Without this axiom, mathematics exists, the numbers exist, but it becomes far messier. The financial crisis was the financial equivalent of mathematics without the axiom of choice. All these products that were traded still existed, but the practice of finance became far, far messier. And in fact, it brought to mind the writings of Maynard Keynes in the 1930s. He identified the concept of irreducible uncertainty, the difference between events you could reasonably calculate probabilities for, the spin of a roulette wheel, and events about which you just didn't know. He actually wrote in the 1930s that market participants have no basis to calculate the risks of the investments they're making. They're plunging into the unknown. So this is actually the big idea that I'd like you to take away with, with you this evening, is that even in a world full of mathematical sophistication and technical complexity, there is still so much we do not know. And how do we deal with that unknown? One needs to use judgment. The embrace of judgment can, the embrace of judgment can change the way one thinks. Using judgment, investments that made sense no longer do. Decisions that one makes changes. The financial markets operate differently. Okay, so my time is coming to an end, and the evening is coming to an end. But I want you, to leave, I want you all to, to go away with one important idea. That even in finance, with all its mathematical sophistication, and in other fields, is the use of judgment as opposed to the over-reliance on mathematical models that is crucial. In finance, it can represent the difference between solvency, calmness, growth on the one hand, and on the other, chaos and bankruptcy. And I will leave, stop there for the Thank last you. talk. Wow, congratulations. So, in this opening event of the Cambridge Science Festival, I can't resist asking you the question, if the superconducting supercollider had been funded, 
and all those physicists had stayed down there in that facility, would we have avoided the financial crisis? So it is a remarkable thing. How much money was spent on the super collider? Two billion dollars. It was too much. Two billion dollars. Bill Clinton wanted to keep it open. Congress, the, the Texan congressional delegation wanted to keep it open, but Congress decided, and my two roommates at Harvard were both physicists, and I remember their face drop. No academic job. Two billion dollars. It was going to cost four billion. It's not a good, not a good economy. Please. Given the recent market history and the, uh, all the evidence that there's no way accurately to predict the market uh, based on the publicly available information, uh, what advice, if any, do you as a professor of statistics have for uh, investors? <coughs> so um, one thing I tend not to do is give investment advice. <laughs> But carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I like to think that one should balance the volatility of one's own earnings stream with one's investments. And given investors, uh, professional investors have highly volatile earnings streams, I like to put my money in government-guaranteed FDIC deposits. <laughs> <laughs> now, were I, were I a tenured professor with a highly highly predictable earnings stream, I would, ex I would recommend all the tenured, my tenured faculty here to um, choose the most speculative investments. <laughs> <laughs> right, you heard it here, folks. Please, yes. <laughs> so I'm just curious, what exactly does the fall of financial engineering look like? There's still structured products, um, and they'll probably continue to exist, um, and they are useful, so what does it look like? It's a very good question. So the, the products that are traded, now they've, they've evolved slightly, so the universe of uh, financial instruments have changed, certainly since 2008, but they still exist and they are still traded. And what, is it, what does it mean to attempt to value and price those given that the, the methods have, have failed? Well, one thing is that now people are working with a much bigger universal set. So this is a very mature, um, immature field. The, the derivatives have only existed for 30 years, so people have often operated under the assumption the last 30 years is the universal set of possible outcomes. Once one says, actually, that was a tiny possible set, the, um, your decision making, your reasoning will change dramatically. Thank you. Please. So, anecdotally, it's been my observation that accountants don't really understand math, and mathematicians often don't really understand people. So, what does it say about our group selection that we put them in the same room? <laughs> so the question is we put mathematicians and accountants in the same room or mathematicians and people in the same room? <laughs> um. <laughs> May I just point out the... The question the, is who are you going to abuse most? That's the question. Uh, <laughs> there is one of the big mistakes of the financial crisis was over-reliance on highly complex models and the more clump, complex the better, i.e. worse. Okay, so the over-reliance was more on the more complex models. And the lack of judgment actually is quite subtle. So you can say, what was the lack of judgment? It was building up many complex models that ultimately became inconsistent with each other. Okay, well, that's a basic misjudgment, basic poor judgment. Okay, and that's something we have to guard against again. What is judgment? So what is good judgment? Well, one needs good judgment to identify good judgment. I think is, is easier, I, this is, is a glib answer, but I think subjective reasoning is inherently important in any decision-making process. However objective, objective you might think a decision-making process is, the choice of the model involves your own decision and you base that on your own experience. So as a statistician, by training, I really emphasize that judgment as subjective reasoning is, is incredibly important for any decision one makes, even if the underlying data and models are very complex. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, hi. Uh, so one of the things that I've read uh, recently is about experiments done with people, um, expert traders and random number generators that are uh, performing trades compared to them, and there seems to be no discernible difference uh, whether you're using that. So, you know, given that idea, where does judgment, how does judgment help you? You are correct. I'm going to take next week off and let my computer do the, do the trading. But I think actually the idea of how to formalize judgment, that's a very difficult thing. That's an intensely human thing. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Right. A very brief final word. It's getting late, but not too late for the reception which follows this or for uh, Yuri's night which follows that over in the Science Center or for another 100 events that you're all going to attend over the next week. But could you all please give a huge hand to our speakers who will stand. Come on, stand. Thank you.